to see you all here this morning. Let's all stand together. Let's turn to page 259 in our hymn books. 259, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. 259. All three verses this morning. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. so good to be here today. God deserves all the glory, doesn't he? Regardless of what's going on, God deserves our glory and praise today. And I'm so glad you're here as we do it corporately as a group. We worship God today. Thank you so much for those who came out. Uh, yesterday, several men came out and worked. We're, uh, we're trying to finish a few more things in the basement, getting it cleaned up a little bit, um, and trying to start using the basement here soon. So uh, we have had several men here. I think we probably uh, goofed around more than we worked some of it, but we got a lot done and uh, we had a good time doing it. But it's good to have you folks here today. Let's open with a word of prayer and begin the service this morning. Brother Bob, would you pray for us? Amen. You may be seated. The choir is going to sing a song for us. Talking about the fact that we are never alone. Aren't you glad for that? Knowing Christ, he's with us, he's always there for us, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We're going to sing this song for you. No, never alone.
be dismissed and head down. The rest of you, we'd like to celebrate birthdays for the month of November. Can you believe it? We're already in November. Good grief, this year's flown by. So, uh, Kevin, would you come up here? We have a special gift for you if you've had a birthday this month. We've got several things in here um, that you can pick from. Um, don't take all day. Nothing's that valuable. Uh, but just grab one out of there. If you have a birthday this month and you're on this side, raise your hand so we can make fun. I mean, sing to you, okay? Uh, Brother Brian, is it your birthday this month? Oh my goodness, Brother Brian, we could embarrass you quite a bit right now. Yes, Ben and John, Brother Cunningham back there. All right, let's sing happy birthday. Once they're done with this side, you folks raise your hand on this side. Kevin will walk through and he'll get a, a gift to each one of you. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. side, raise your hand, or in the center, if it's your birthday this month, we have son, Miss Tara, right here, yes, okay, should we embarrass her or not, where's Brother Justin, yes, we got a yes back there, Brother Lewis, it's your birthday this month, good, good, more birthdays as he's going through that, how many of you have an anniversary in the month of November, oh, my goodness, we'll, we'll get Kevin running back over here, all right, anyone else have a birthday over here? Speak now, forever hold your peace. All right, come right, right here, Miss Tara. Run up here. And then uh, it looks like we have a couple anniversaries here. Make sure we get those anniversaries. And I was really excited to hear... Okay, and the baby's birthday should be soon. Yes, a couple anniversaries over here. Good. Frank and Amber, good this month. And Robbie and Kim right there, good. Anyone else that we missed or you just didn't want to be known? <laughs> I heard, you can bring that back up here. I heard Ryan and Alex got married in the last couple weeks. Can we, would you guys stand? We've been excited about this. Would you give them a big hand? They got married and uh, we praise the Lord for that. We've known them for a while and finally tied the knot and uh, now they're stuck. <laughs> oh boy. You guys can be seated, but praise the Lord. Uh, they've been good friends for a while now and we praise the Lord for that exciting news. They didn't know I was going to embarrass them, but what a blessing that is. All right, uh, let's do this. Let's Let's go to uh, this chorus up here, gentlemen. Let's uh, sing, let's talk about Jesus, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed at Junior Church, and we'll shake hands and greet one another. Gentlemen, do you have that song up there for us? <clears throat> Maybe. All right, good job. Just go ahead. There we go. You're dismissed to Junior Church.
Friday as we make our way back to say this thing is course. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of Kings is He. seated. All right. And for uh, several have been asking about uh, James Bailey. He is uh, home now. He was in the hospital, then the rehabilitation facility, then back in the hospital, then back in the rehabilitation facility. And he is home. And he wanted me, he wrote a, a letter a couple weeks ago and he forgot to give it to me, but I saw him yesterday and he wanted me to read this. I would like to thank you for all the cards uh, and visits that you have made, but most of all, the prayers you have made for me. I am having rehab at uh, Morrison Woods. This was at the time he was there. I hope to be home soon and then back to church. So he is planning on next Sunday being back in church with us, but I know his health has just kind of been up and down. So you continue to pray for him, but he wanted me to read that uh, today. So praise the Lord for that. Um, tonight after the evening service, we'll have a business meeting and I'll go over uh, a few things about the building and uh, just uh, financially where we're at with everything and I'm um, looking forward to that time. Tomorrow night will be a ladies Bible study at 6 o'clock and then there are some discussions. Ladies who are a part of that, um, make sure uh, Miss Connie will be asking you about maybe moving that um, just to help as it gets darker earlier in the evenings, maybe for those who struggle driving in the evenings that late. Um, so I think Miss Connie will be getting in touch with you all about a, a day. Okay. But not, not this one. Tomorrow night we'll still be here. Okay. And then, ladies, just be in touch with Miss Connie. They'll move it to Saturdays for at least three of them, and uh, then we'll go from there. So if you have any questions about that, just talk to Miss Connie. Um, next uh, Sunday night after the evening service, teachers, if you're a teacher in the church, uh, I want you to uh, be part of a meeting we're going to have after the service that night. And then, of course, uh, November 20th, we'll have our Thanksgiving dinner at 530. And I want you all to come, uh, bring a dish to pass or several, and uh, you come on out and you be with us for that Thanksgiving dinner. Um, that's going to be a wonderful time reflecting on everything God's done for the church this year. And it's going to take a while to get through everything God's done. And I hope to try to show you some of the things that maybe you haven't been able to see, uh, some behind the scenes uh, things, but I want you to see how great God's been. Isn't it good over the last few weeks to see the church, weeks, last few months, just to see the church grow? Um, I know some of you are really on me to get more pews out here, and uh, we, are, we are getting there, I promise. We're, uh, we've got a couple steps to take in order to get those pews ready, but we're probably going to be putting more more pews in, and uh, you keep filling them. We'll keep uh, we'll keep bringing them in. So praise the Lord for that. Ushers, go ahead and come forward. You continue to give back to God a portion of what He's given to us. God has blessed us greatly, and we want to be faithful with what He's given. Let's have a word of prayer. And uh, it's it's good to see Brother Dallas this morning. A little nervous for him last night, but good to have Brother Dallas. Would you pray for us for the offering?
for our last hymn this morning. Let's turn to page 331. 331, tell me the old, old story. Let's just sing the first and last verse on this one. 331. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to singing this morning. All right, if you would, take a Bible. Uh, for choir members, we will not have choir practice tonight. We will not be having choir practice tonight. I'll give you a, a few extra minutes to your nap this afternoon. Um, of course, we'll still have church at 630, but we'll not have choir tonight. Uh, be in prayer uh, for Tara and Justin Edwards tomorrow, as we're expecting the baby to be here very soon. And uh, so you be in prayer uh, for this little one that's coming and for the family here. Um, take your Bible, go to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Last week, um, I don't know what day it was, I was reading through some parts of Matthew, and I was, I was on a topic and on a thought, and I was reading through, and I came to Matthew 22, and um, I, I think we need to share some things from this chapter, and we're going to do so. It's a parable that Jesus gives. He's talking to the religious elite of the day, and uh, we'll explain some of what Jesus is alluding to and uh, what he's talking about. But I really want you to consider some things today. We're going to look at three invitations from, uh, from God and the reaction from the enemy. So we'll look at three invitations and then the reaction from the enemy. We'll look at several of these verses, but if you would, uh, take a Bible, go to Matthew 22. If you would, please stand as we read God's Word, if you're physically able. If you don't have a Bible, grab one from the pew in front of you. I'd love for you to be uh, looking along. If you don't have one at all, you can feel free to take that one home with you and have a copy of God's Word at your house. Brother Bob, would you come up and would you read verses 1 through 8 of Matthew 22? And then would you have a word of prayer for us? Matthew 22, verse 1 through 8. I've heard of several people struggling with different things today, different prayer requests. So when you pray, would you just ask God to be with our people, even those who might be struggling this morning. Matthew 22, 1 through 8. And Jesus answered and, and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were hidden to pardon me, which were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he set forth another servant, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are filled, are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, 
and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he went forth, sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you have us here in your house today to hear your word. Lord, there's so many of us here with different issues. Lord to God, and I ask that you would just touch them, Lord. Reach down to the great position. You can take care of all these things. You can change lives and situations. There's nothing too hard for you. Father God, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I've been singing about my Lord for many years. I've sung when I've been happy. I've sung when I've had tears. And some folks may question if it's all been just a show. But the reason that I'm singing trial and I've watched the saddened faces turn into happy smiles then I bowed my head and whispered Lord please do the same for me Miss Jessica. Wonderful song. We sing not because of what's going on around us, but we sing and give praise to the Lord because there is an empty grave. And that's not going to change. We sing because there's a home prepared for us and waiting for us, and that's not going to change. We sing because of what Jesus has done. As we begin today, I had a, a joke I read for my uh, Sunday school, and they laughed at it, so I thought I'd try again with this crowd. Um, so we'll see if you guys are as gracious as my Sunday school. Timmy didn't want to put his money in the offering plate Sunday morning, so his mother decided to use some hurried creative reasoning with him. You don't want that money, honey, do you? She whispered in his ear. Quick, drop it in the plate. It's tainted. Horrified, the little boy obeyed. After a few seconds, he whispered, But, Mommy, why was the money tainted? Was it dirty? Oh, no, dear, she replied. It's not really dirty. It's just, it ain't, excuse me, it just 
taint yours and it taint mine. And she replied, it's God's. Um, All right, you weren't as gracious as my Sunday school. I thought it was good, all right. Matthew 22, no, I'm not talking about your money today, all right? Don't tune me out right now, okay? We're not going to do that just yet. Matthew 22, we come to a portion of Scripture um, I find very important that we need to know. Uh, Jesus gives this parable. He's going to use some illustrations here, and I want to jump into this today. But understand where we are in the text. So um, uh, I use uh, different people. I'll read and try to find where we're at. Where is Jesus when he's writing this? And I believe this is probably, probably somewhere, uh, pro uh, several uh, commentators believe this is on Tuesday before he's crucified. This is just a few days. He's already entered Jerusalem on that Sunday. He's already had his disciples go and uh, bring the colt. He's already walked into Jerusalem and they've cried Hosanna. And he's already done those things. And now in chapter 21, he, he gives a parable where he's, I don't want to say attacking, but giving truths um, uh, against the Pharisees, against those who thought they were good enough in and of their works for heaven, against those who were pointing people away from Jesus Christ, back to the law for salvation. And he's kind of been pretty tough on them. He talked about the sin of the rulers and the persecution of the prophets. So with that in mind, in chapter 22, he's going to even point, maybe even a little more directly so, at the Pharisees. But it's also a lesson for you and I today. Jesus had taught in a manner that upset the Pharisees. By the way, we as Christians, we want to teach the Bible the way the Bible is written. Not to change the Bible to fit what's going on today. Because there's a lot of things the Bible teaches that others would say, Well, Pastor, you don't understand. That was for them back then. No, 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 no. No, no, no. We teach the Bible as God wanted it taught. We're not worried if people say, Well, Pastor, you know, that offends people. I'll tell you what, I'm much more worried about what God thinks than what people think. Amen? I, I, Jesus is very direct when he is teaching. Jesus doesn't cut corners. Jesus tells it like it is. And I think that's important as long as we're using Scripture and not using personal opinion. I know there's many times personal opinion comes in and we can be very passionate, but we've got to make sure it's Bible. Amen? I think that would be our goal here. We want to preach what God said. We want that to be taught to us. And if you're a Christian, you want to know what God said. You don't want to, you know, make things up and every different year we have something new. We want to know what God said. So let's kind of look at this just a little bit uh, uh, this, this morning. Uh, this took place the week of the crucifixion. He has healed so many. He's taught for three years. He was about to die for the sins of humanity in our place. And if you're taking notes tonight, he's going to give us uh, three invitations and a reaction. So we're going to have four points today, and I'll give those point number one. We're going to see an illustration he is going to use. But before we do that, I want to share with you a story as we begin. A certain missionary society, in order to gain access for a missionary to work in some of the African tribes, sent down trinkets to be bartered with the natives. Among them was a package of little hand mirrors, such as certain ladies might use. The natives had never seen their own face except in the waters of some lakes or streams. So the news of this wonderful instrument, which people could see their features, were spread abroad. The missionary was invited by tribe after tribe to visit them with this hand glass. In the interior was a princess in one of the tribes who had been told that she was the most beautiful woman on earth. She'd never seen herself before. She'd never seen her reflection. Everyone around her just told her, you are the most beautiful woman on earth. When she heard of this instrument with, with pride, she wanted to see what the most beautiful woman on earth looked like. She had the missionaries come and they brought one of the mirrors. She held it up and with her own terminology, she was not the most beautiful woman in the world. 
but she had to look at a mirror to see herself for who she really was. And she, what she did at that point, she banned the missionaries, she banned the mirrors because she didn't like anything to show who she really was. Now, was there anything wrong with her? Absolutely not. But she was so filled with pride at the thought she, everyone had always told her how, how, how wonderful, how this and how that. And when she saw, she said, no, I'm not that. I'm banning all those mirrors. And sometimes we have this thought about ourselves and about what religion truly is. We don't look at God's word and reflect, okay, what am I really? Let's look at three invitations and this reaction today. If you would look at this with me in verse one of chapter 22, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down the illustration. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Paul or Jesus is going to give this story. Look at verse one and two, the illustration. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by what? Parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his who? Now that's very important in this illustration that Jesus is going to use all the emphasis on the wedding is going to be on the son. That's going to be very important. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But I want you to see this illustration. The kingdom of heaven or salvation or the place where uh, Christ presides on the throne. Uh, he's, that's what he's referring to. Two reasons for this feast. Number one was to honor the Son and to show the joy of the kingdom. Honor the Son and to show the joy of the kingdom. So Jesus here is teaching. Who's he directly talking to, it seems like? The Pharisees and people who would attack him throughout time. So I want you to see this in the terminology. Wedding feasts were rich, free, joyful. Many times they would take several days for a wedding feast to, to, to take place. So people of this day would know what a marriage meant and what a marriage, you know, the joy that surrounded it and the, the food and all the preparation and all these things. You guys took a long time to plan your wedding, no doubt. But in one of these weddings, in this culture, it would have lasted several days. It would have been a time of joy, would have been a time of happiness. People would have come from all over. They would have stayed. It would have been wonderful. So he compares it to this wedding feast. He said, there's a king, he made a marriage for his son. Now, just so we understand who the context is talking about, the king is God, the son is Jesus. Okay? So in context, as we go through this story, we're going to look at it with that in mind. Look at verse 3, if you would. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. So the marriage feast was for the son. It was not in our culture, in our, our mindsets, when, when we have a wedding, when the bride comes down, everybody stands up, everybody stops, everybody turns and looks at the young lady as she comes walking down the aisle. All the attention, the big day is for the who? The bride. Oh, the big day. It's a special moment. I remember my wedding day and being up there. And uh, I've told you this before. Uh, it was some of the most terrible few moments of my life. And I'll explain for a moment here. My, it started off well. I came up. I stood by the pastor. I had my best man there and had a couple, uh, a couple of my brothers, my groomsmen. And we were standing up there. And, oh, it was an exciting time. And then I started to get nervous. And then I started to sweat uncontrollably uncontrollably and my family thought it was funny so they're laughing at me and some people are feeling bad for me and you know when you're the center of attention and you're nervous you just get more nervous and then more nervous and I'm you know I'm trying to you know just very you know like you know but everybody sees you you're up there and then they call down and the the, the, the whole service points to the back and quest comes to the door and I look and oh I calm down I get so excited it's my bride I've been waiting for this moment I've never held my wife's hand up to this point I've never kissed my wife I've never hugged my wife we wanted to wait for that special time at our wedding I've never done that I was she comes walking she's the most beautiful woman in the world everything stops in that room 
points to her. And I can't wait to go down. And the, the preacher says, who gives this, this woman away? And uh, the, the, her dad would say, her mother and I, and I would go down and bring her up. But they threw a curveball at me. I was all nervous, and I knew if I could just get Quest up there, I could look across from her, I could calm down, and I'd be just, man, it'd be wonderful. Comes down with her dad. Stops at the altar. The pastor, unbeknownst to me, starts to give the plan of salvation at the beginning. This plan of salvation. I'm for the gospel. I'm for the plan of salvation. I'm for that at the weddings. That's okay. But do it at the end when I've gone out and not standing in front of people. I was never told that we were going to have a long invitation at the beginning of the wedding. So I'm sitting there, and she's standing right there, and she's all nervous. But then she comes down. She'll tell you this story, too. She comes down, and she sees me. And she, all of her nerves were gone. She's just nervous for me. I'm just, I'm just pouring sweat. I'm so nervous. I, I don't want to be the center of attention like that. I didn't, you know, I wanted her to come up. And now it goes on and on and on. And I'm sitting there in my head, and I would never say this, you know, out loud. But I'm thinking, I honestly don't care about the plan of salvation. I want her to come up here. You you tell us to say, do you say I do? I'll say I do, and I want to get out of here. I don't want to sit here any longer. Anyway, it was, it was a crazy day, but praise the Lord, we got through it. I'm married. It's done. I, I'm stuck now, too. So we're stuck together, right? What a special time. But all the focus was on the bride. And it was in these weddings... In this wedding that they're talking about, the focus is on the sun. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. Remember, life now and forever is about honoring the Son of God. The life now is about honoring the Son of God in every area, in every aspect, in our, in our patience, in our honor, and pursuing, and forgiving, and loving. Every aspect of our life now and into eternity is about honoring the Son. Amen? Honoring Jesus Christ with our life. And also remembering that God is prepared and things are going to be great. Now we see this illustration he's given us. Now I want to get through some of these verses here. Look at verse 3. I want you to see the first invitation. So the king is having a wedding for the son. Verse 3. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not what? They were not interested. Now, I believe from my understanding, this is referring to the Old Testament prophets. You're going to see how this all ties together in just a minute. I believe he's talking to the Pharisees and confronting them, talking about access to salvation, talking about coming to God through Christ. And the prophets came and warned the people of Israel, but they would not turn. They would not come. They would not listen. They did not want it. Notice the second invitation, if you will. Again, so he has this wedding. He's going to honor the son. He tells everyone to come, and they say, no, we're not interested. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. I've prepared everything. All you have to do is come. What happens when the second group go out? He said, come unto the marriage. But notice what they do in verse 5. But they made light of it. And went there what? The father, the king, has prepared this wedding feast. And he's gone to all this work. He's done all the hardship. All you have to do is come. But what was the problem in verse 5? They made light of it and they went their way. One to his farm, one to his merchandise. They were too busy to come to honor the son. They had too many things going on. They had too much happening to come to the son. They were too preoccupied with their lives and their personal desires. They made light of the invitation. Matthew Henry, a commentator, uh, says this, The Father was ready to accept us. The Son was ready to intercede for us. The Spirit to sanctify us. Pardon was ready. Peace was ready. Comfort was ready. Joy was ready. The promises were ready. They were not concerned with the glorification of the Son. They scoffed at it. They were too busy. They had too much going on. So now, let's follow along with the story. What happens now? And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and what? 
This is talking about how the Jewish people treated the prophets. They killed them. God's messengers would come and they would kill them. What did they do to John the Baptist? Beheaded him. What did they do to even Jesus Christ? They killed him. What did they do to the apostles? All but John. They killed him. It wasn't for lack of trying with John, by the way. John just survived major problems. They are saying, hey, we've invited you. We've asked you to come. We've done everything. And what did they do to the prophets, the messengers? They killed them. They killed them. They were not ready. They were too busy. They were thinking about all these different things. Life was going by, and they didn't want to miss anything in life. They rejected it. All this time, the king did nothing. Look at verse 7, if you would. Look at verse 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their what? I believe Jesus is referring to time after time after time they rejected him. And I believe he's referring to A.D. 70. When General Titus comes in with the Roman army, and he comes and he starts war with Jerusalem, and there are many zealots and many people who wanted to fight, and they couldn't, in, they couldn't get into Jerusalem. So what they did is they sent up a wall outside of Jerusalem, and they starved the people in Jerusalem. And it was at Passover time, so people were coming from all over, and the Roman general allowed people to come inside the city. Why? So they could help eat all the food, so they starve out quicker. And when they finally broke through, and when they finally got in there, uh, d d d Titus uh, massacred people, and killed people, and tortured people, and as people tried to leave during the starvation, there are stories of what he would do to them in front of the people of Jerusalem. It's a horrible time. He desecrated the temple, tore it down piece by piece. Jews still mourn today for that temple. They rejected him. They wouldn't listen. So God used Rome. Rome would come in. They would completely tear down their beloved religious system, their beloved temple. And many people would be taken back when Titus would come in to his dad, who has just became emperor uh, after Nero passed comes back and he's hauling several young men in chains and in shackles from Jerusalem. And they would bring them and they would come into the, the, the they would have entertainment, they would have wild animals kill them for their entertainment, and they would fight the gladiators. They wouldn't listen. They didn't care. It wasn't important. So now we're at the time you and I are at today. We're in the age of grace, the church age, if you will. So look at how the story shifts. They've said, no, he said, come. He said, I'm ready. I've done everything that was needed. But look down at verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. So now what do we do? This was mainly focused on Jerusalem, mainly focused on Israel, mainly focused around what God had blessed and God had loved, and they rejected him. So now what does he tell his servants to do? He said, go into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So it goes from Jerusalem and Israel and goes out and about it. The apostles would take it and the early church would take it. And everyone was bidden to come to this wedding feast. Everyone was bidden and told, you can come to honor the Son. The third invitation. God will not be scoffed or laughed at. All that should oppose Christ and the gospel message will meet their doom. You can mock, you can laugh, you can turn your back, you can be too, uh, too uh, preoccupied with your lifestyle and the way you've always been taught. You can say, I'm not ready, I don't want it, I don't care. But God will not be mocked and made a fool of. He went through all of that to send his son and they would reject him and murder him, Jesus Christ. 
Um, the reason for this is because of unbelief. Take your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter 3, would you just briefly today? Let's kind of keep you awake here. You see this parable that he's given, he's teaching, and he's showing them what they've done to his messengers, to his people. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, would you? I want you to see a, a, an illustration, if you will, from the children of Israel. Look at chapter 3, and I want you to look down at verse 16 and 17. Talking about Israel. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Look at verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Do you remember the story of Israel? They've been brought out of Egypt. They've been given food. They've been given everything they need. They cross the Red Sea. They come to the promised land. God lays out everything. And what do they do? I don't think we can go in there. It's too bad. You know, there's big bullies in there. There's armies in there. There's not enough food. We're not going to make it. Why could they not enter in? Because of unbelief. Back in our parable today in the book of Matthew chapter 22, people did not believe. They were too busy. They didn't think it was important. It wasn't all that big of a deal. I'll just get up tomorrow and I'll figure something out. I want you to see... The invitation, we've seen three of them, right? I want you to see the indignation. The indignation. People are there. It's, it's wonderful. It's a great time. Look at verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guest, who are we seeing as the king here? God, right? Does God care who comes to the feast? Yeah, so he's walking around. He came in to see the guest. He saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now, if I could just say this, the king, God, takes a special interest in those who profess to glorify his son. He takes a special interest in those who profess, I'm a Christian, I glorify the son. You know what, let's do this. Go to Revelation chapter 2, the last book of the Bible. Will you stay with me? I promise I'll be done here very soon. Revelation chapter 2. I want to tie all of this together here in just a moment. They didn't believe. They didn't think it was necessary. They thought they had other things going on. They were very religious. And eventually God had to take out what they held so dearly. It wasn't the son. It wasn't the sacrifice that was to come. It was a religious background. It was religious activity. It's what they held on so dearly. God had to come and take it out. And eventually they would come back and God would keep his promise. The Messiah would still come and all those things would happen. Look at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 1 and 2. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write these things, saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy what? And thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. I want you to understand that God knows those who profess to glorify his Son. He knows and he takes great interest in them. By the way, today, if you are one of his children, he takes great interest in you. Say, Pastor, why don't we have to worry about things to come? Because God takes an interest in me as his child. I am his heir. <laughs> in Romans chapter 8, right? God takes a special interest in me. Back in chapter Matthew, or excuse me, back in chapter 22 of Matthew. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw the man that had not on a wedding garment. Now there's a lot of dispute and arguing over what that wedding garment was. They say in this time, if you came, there is a certain way you would dress when you would come. And if you didn't have the proper garments at the door, the king would provide the garments for the people. And if you came in and you rejected the king's garments and you came into the wedding feast, you 
would be unprepared. And therefore, you would come in thinking you could get there any way you want, and you would not bring glory to the Son. So now look at the indignation in this parable in verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He didn't have the right garment. He didn't meet the standards of the king to glorify the son. God noticed each individual. And he saw one that came and was arrogant and cocky and thought he knew what was best and he didn't want to take what was offered by the king. He was underdressed. This guest refused the demands of the king. The king had done everything up to this point. He had the food ready. He had everything set. He had the tables ready. He had the, the, he had the, 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 everything was just perfect. And all you had to do was come his way. But they came in and they said, nope. Nope. I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm, I look pretty good, I think, myself. And the king took notice of that. And what does the king do? You see, this is, where, this is where sometimes we think, well, that's, that's, that's just a parable. God doesn't really do this. Let's look at this next verse. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. No, 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 no. You said I could come. You said it would be great. You said it would be wonderful. You said this would be perfect. And the king says, you don't want to come here. You don't want to be here. You don't care about honoring the son. You don't care about what I've laid out. You're full of pride. You're full of arrogance. You don't want to be here. You can go to a place where there is no light. There is constant pain. You don't want to come God's way. You want to make it up as you go. There will come a time where you'll be cast out. There will be weeping in outer darkness for all of eternity. Say, Pastor, God is loving. God is caring. Yes, he is. He sent his son to to die and all you have to do is accept his gift come his way the king said you're you don't want to be here you don't really like this agenda you don't have to stay these are my this is the standard the indignation of the king you had your chance you chose wrong he had no excuse friend everything was there for him he was speechless his, his tongue was tied what could he say? What could he say? The Bible goes on to say in verse 14, many are called and few are chosen. The reason why he didn't stay is because he wasn't clothed with the proper attire. It's a picture. One day, the Pharisees had made fun and had mocked the message of the prophets and God judged Israel time and time again to try to turn their hearts back to him and they said no till eventually a man by the name of John the Baptist came and he was coming before Jesus and he was promoting Jesus is coming it lined up with the Old Testament but they were so blinded with their own pride and their own thoughts they killed the messenger John the Baptist and then Jesus comes. He does more miracles than anyone ever has. He talks like no one else. He's done everything to meet the qualifications to be the Messiah. And what do they do to him? They kill him. And yet God said, hey, go out tell everyone. Hey, go tell the Gentiles. Go take the gospel to Europe. Go take the gospel to all these different continents. Take the gospel to the world. Everyone's welcome to come. Why do we as a church push the gospel message? Because we want to tell everyone you're welcome in the kingdom. You're welcome. You can come. But you've got to come his way. I believe in my heart there will be many people. I'm not talking about the unsaved, uncaring world that doesn't care anything about the church. I'm talking about those in the church. I wonder how many have come God's way. You can't just get there any way you want. You can't just get there by being a good person. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. 
And do you know what the Pharisees are going to do? Look at the last point here today, and we'll be through. Verse 15, this instigation. This instigation. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. He uses these parables, and they know he's focused on them. And instead of turning to Christ and falling at the mercy of a holy God and saying, I am unfit for the kingdom of heaven. I am unfit to, 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 to even be with you, God. I know I'm a sinner. I believe that sin demands a punishment. And I believe the punishment was taken by Jesus Christ. And I accept him as my Savior. I turn to you, Lord. I accept you. Instead of that, what did they do? They instigated other people. Oh, Judas Iscariot would come in just a little while and they're going to pay Judas Iscariot some money to betray him. They're trying to twist him up. And so often when we're confronted with the truth of the gospel, we want to find other ways. We want to push it aside. We want to mock religion. And there's too many out there who've been hurt. And what do they do? They always want to throw down religion. They always want to push it back. The instigation. This parable demonstrates the indifference to the gospel and those antagonistic to the gospel and those unchanged by the gospel. None of them enjoyed the king's feast. None of them enjoyed the wonders of heaven. Why? They did it their way. They did it their way. So many truths through these passages. But the invitation is still there today. Hey, take it to the highways, the byways, take it out and about. If truth is presented, then change to conform more like him. This was provision for the perishing. Let me ask you this. Have you responded to the invitation? Have you responded to the invitation? Has there been a time where you've come to the end of yourself? As an 11-year-old boy, I had to come to that point. And I bowed my head and I humbled myself before a holy God. Have you responded to the invitation? Or are you too busy? Time and time again, I'm too busy. It's inconvenient. Christ really isn't my thing. I'm not ready. I'm not. That's not my thing. It's not me right now. I've got things to do. I've got a job to do. I've got this to do. I've got kids to raise. I've got all these different things. God says, I've done everything necessary. I sent my son to the cross to die in your place. I've done all that. I've taken care of it. The gospel's for everyone. How are we doing as a church at getting it out? How are we doing? Could we do better? Could we? I think if we all examine how are we getting this message out that we hold on to so closely and so tightly... How, how, how many more missionaries could we send out? How many more people could you and I personally witness to? And we have such a burden with the gospel message. God's done all the hard work. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to go sacrifice ourselves. We don't have to shed our own blood. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Do you need to come to him today? Today needs to be that day you quit pushing it off and you quit pushing it aside and you quit saying, well, it's not that big of a deal. I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it another time. Don't push it off. Don't push it off. Jesus gives this very clear illustration. Of course, in a couple days, they're going to kill Jesus. They had chance after chance after chance, and they refused. Heads bowed and eyes closed today. I want to encourage you with something. Not everyone will be in the kingdom. No, friend. Only those who've come God's way. God did everything for Israel. And they kept killing the people he would send to them. They rejected it. They wouldn't listen to it. Oh, how that grieved God. But can I tell you this? I'm so glad that God sent his son even though God justly could have just said, they don't want it, get rid of them all. No, 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 he sent his son to die in your place. A couple of things I want you to do today in this response. Number one, maybe it is you need to come and tell him thank you. 
Maybe you need to come and say, oh, you've done everything for me. I need to share this message with others. Maybe you need to come and say, I don't know if I died today, I'd spend eternity in heaven. I've kind of done my thing. I've lived the way I've wanted to live without caring about the commandments of Jesus Christ. I've been with people. I've done this. I've done that. I've done all these things. I've done it my way. Would today be the day you say, I'm ready. I need to talk to somebody about this. I do. What is it you need to do today? The altar's open. You do business with God as you see fit. Have you shared it with people? Is it a big deal to you? Don't leave here without knowing. Don't leave here without trusting. Several will come. If you need to, if you want to talk to somebody and you're a lady, I'll get a lady up here to talk with you. If you're a man, I'll get a man to talk with you about things. You come and do business with God. Lord's working on your heart. Please don't uh, delay. Come forward and uh, seek the Lord in prayer. 295, let's sing verse 1. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. Heavenly Father, God, we need you and we love you. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, I pray today that you would help us to understand the importance of serving you. And God, the importance of knowing you. The importance of having a relationship with you. God, I pray you'd convict us today. Lord, I pray that each one of us would be bearers of the gospel. Each one of us would share it in the highways and byways. Take it to this world, our cities. Lord, I love you. I thank you for Jesus. If you would, please stand and look this way. Thank you for being faithful to God's house. Tonight we'll be back at 6.30 as we're almost done with the book of Acts. We'll be in the last chapter this evening. I hope to see you there tonight. And uh, God bless you. Have a great week. Brother Brian, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we again thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to meet this morning, Father, to worship you. Father, I thank you for our church and for each and every member, Father. Thank you for each and every family who's come out this morning. And I just pray that you would bless each and every one. And Lord, bless those, Father, who would love to be here, but as for uh, certain reasons, maybe health issues or whatever, uh, they are unable to. Lord, I just pray that you just uh, bless them also, Lord. Father, now I do pray that you would uh, watch over us and protect us, Father, as we go our separate ways. And Father, bring us all back the next upon an hour we do pray. Jesus' precious name, amen.